turn to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 8 for our study here this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And as we are doing so, we're going to dismiss our youngsters. Sixth grade and under can head down to Children's Church. Trust that the Lord will bless as they go. Again, grateful for our leaders, our teachers, those that are working with our kids. We are very, very thankful for that. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good to see you this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we were just in this passage. I think we at least looked at some of this briefly last week. We're dealing with the wealth of wisdom, or the wisdom of wealth, I should say. There is a lot of wealth in wisdom as well, but there's uh, certainly wisdom in the wealth that God has blessed us with. And this is a, a text that I really believe is probably premier. Uh, somebody has defined it as the most detailed model of Christian giving in the New Testament. It's found here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and it, and it spills over into chapter 9, the first 15 verses of that chapter. And so it's a great, great book to be in. And we trust that the Lord will bless our time in it here this morning. Let's ask for the Lord's blessing, and uh, we will go from there. Father, we are grateful again for the time that we can come and worship you. And we've already talked about the, really the privilege that we have to know you, to love you, to serve you, and yea, even to come together as a, a body of believers and worship you. And we trust, Lord, as you've already been pleased with that which we have offered up to you. And now I pray, Father, that you'll help us to give our undivided attention to really what the Holy Spirit will have for us here this morning. I pray that we hear from heaven. I pray that as we look at these, um, these words off of Scripture here this morning, that they'll not just be uh, mere words, but uh, may they resonate with our, with our hearts, with our minds. Uh, I pray, Father, that we're able to glean a, a special truth about the greatest giver of all time. And, uh, Lord, may we rejoice in, in the good message uh, that you have for us by way of your word. Use it mightily in our lives here today. And Lord, for that, we're going to thank you. We're going to thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. For it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Well, if I were to give you a title to today's study, it would simply be the greatest giver of all time. You know, that word greatest is what they would call a superlative adjective. And I know if you're anything like me, I didn't like English when I was in school. I, I did what I had to do. I did okay and moved on. But I'll tell you when I really learned my English, when I learned a foreign language. Uh, I had to study Greek when I was in Bible school for a couple of years. And uh, I really, uh, I came at it from a deficit end. I didn't know my English well. Well, it's really hard to learn another language when they're going back and forth between English and Greek or whatever other language you're learning. So I learned a little bit more about it then. But I will tell you this. I know what a superlative is. A superlative really is a word that is describing, in this case, the giver. And it really is uh, taking this individual to the highest degree possible. When you talk about somebody being the greatest, that means there's nobody greater. He is the greatest. Uh, let me give you an example. I personally believe that Michael Jordan is the greatest basketball player to ever play the game. Can I hear an amen? Good. I hope you guys aren't LeBron James lovers. He wants to be the greatest, but he doesn't even hold a candle, in my opinion, to Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan, by far, is the greatest, meaning that nobody is better than Michael Jordan. He'll probably go down in the quarters of time as being the greatest, at least in the estimation of some of us. You get the idea of the greatest. When it comes to the greatest giver, the greatest, <clears throat> is there anybody greater than God himself? <clears throat> and when I talk about God, I know that we could really, again, refine this with regard to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I believe that, again, co-equal, co-equal even in their giving. But when it comes to the Lord Jesus in particular, who we're going to really focus on here because of the season that is upon us, truly he is the greatest giver of all time. He gave us his life. And the text that you're open to here, I think, is a phenomenal passage of scripture here. Uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 8, look at just this one verse here, uh, verse 9. The Bible says, for ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he, that's a reference to Christ, was rich, yet for your sakes or our sakes, he, Christ, became poor, that ye, that's you and me, through his poverty, Christ's poverty, we might be made rich. It's a great passage of Scripture. Now, here's what's really interesting as you study this. This is 
a, a passage of Scripture in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. It's really dealing with grace, the grace of God. And, and we know that grace has been defined as God's unmerited favor, God giving us that which we don't deserve. We could look at grace in a number of different ways. Grace is really written all over this chapter in particular. Some seven times the word grace will show up. Five, it's translated in English, grace. One time it's translated gift. Another time the word grace, charis in the original language, is translated thanks. But all of that to say that grace is written all over the passage. I want you to just kind of get a little feel for what's going on here. Look at verse 1, the, the context here. Paul writes, moreover, brethren, he's addressing Christians, we do to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the children of Macedonia. In other words, we want you to see how the grace of God was evident in the lives of the believers there in a place called Macedonia. Um, again, a, a small town, and yet God's grace was written all over these believers in that particular town. He goes on and tells us, verse 2 and following, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we uh, would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. What is Paul saying so far? Paul is saying, hey, here's this town of believers, this church of believers up in Macedonia, and they didn't have a whole lot. And they were going through some very difficult times. And yet the grace of God was so evident in the lives of these individuals that they went above and beyond in caring for the needs of other saints and primarily in the area of Jerusalem and other places. But this is a church, again, that was very, very generous. And yet, again, generosity is not always measured by the, the amount of the dollars. Uh, you, you say, well, somebody contributes $1,000 and somebody contributes $100. Well, the $1,000 is very generous. Hey, listen, he is generous, but the guy who's given $100 may be even more generous because of his, his financial picture, his financial circumstances. So the chapter is really, again, a, a demonstration of, of Christian giving. It's one of the greatest in, in, the, in the New Testament here, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 into chapter 9. But nestled, nestled in this text is an incredible passage of scripture, the one that we just looked at here in verse nine. And why it is so important is this is not a dissertation on Christology. Paul isn't used in chapter eight to write all about uh, Christ, the son of God, God the son, and how he came to this earth and, and uh, a, a number of things about. He's not writing chapter eight for that purpose. He's writing about the grace of God that has been bestowed on believers and how they respond to the grace of God by way of their generous giving to the needs of others. It's not a, a doctrinal study on soteriology, which would again be, how does a person get saved? Uh, he's, he's not, he's not I, I don't know, I have to read it again. I read through it a couple times. I don't remember reading about salvation in the chapter here, chapter 8. So, so I'm saying for this reason, it's not dealing with these heavy doctrines of Christology or soteriology or ecclesiology or whatever other ology you want to put in there. But nestled in this passage of scripture, dealing with, again, the grace of God bestowed on believers, demonstrated through their generosity, comes this one passage that takes Christ and exalts him as the ultimate example of giving. There is no one that could outgive or give more than Christ. In fact, I have to tell you, uh, and I wish this was all original with me, but somebody has said, never has one who was so rich become so poor. Look at the text again. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. Never has one so rich become so poor. It would go on and say, no one ever started so high and became so low. When you consider Christ for who he is and what he has done, where he was in this exalted position of majesty and splendor and angels worshiping him and doing his very beck and will, no one was ever started so high and became so low. He entered into humanity. The creator God himself became part of this created world. He came as a man, born as a child, born as a babe. 
Not only was he exalted, he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. Look at the rest of that, that through his poverty, uh, uh, that, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Never has one who was so poor become so rich. Who is the ones that is so poor? That's you and me. We spiritually are bankrupt. We, are, we, we have nothing to offer God. In our sin and selfishness, it was, life was all about me and my world. And, and I was focused on what I could do and how I can do it and when I wanted to do it. And, and it was all about me and my world and, and my little sphere. And, 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 oh, I paid a token of respect to God when I would go to church on Sunday, but, but God wasn't a real part of my life. I had a religion, but I didn't have a relationship. And so God wanted something more in my life. And I had to come to the end of myself and realize that I am spiritually bankrupt. Uh, there is nothing good or worthy in me. I am simply poor, poor uh, before a holy God who has it all. I was never so poor. And then I became so rich when I came to Jesus Christ and understood what he did for me on that cross of Calvary. It's, it's a neat passage of scripture. And again, it's nestled in this text here that's dealing with giving, but, but it's for this reason. Paul is gonna say, hey, you think the Macedonian believers were good? Hey, you Corinthians think you can outdo the Macedonian believers? Hey, let me give you one that you cannot outdo. The greatest giver in all of time, none other than Lord Jesus himself. An incredible gift that he has given us. And so I want you to understand that today we're not going to be talking about our financial stewardship. That's all throughout the text. You could read this here. Uh, we're not really, again, talking about uh, 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 giving uh, by way of, of uh, what we are going to put in the offering plates. I want you to see again from the text here this morning that this truly is introducing to us the greatest, the greatest, the ultimate example of giving in the person of Jesus Christ. And so there's a phenomenal picture that is painted here in this text, and I hope and pray that we do not miss it. Again, it's got grace written all over it. In fact, if you again you even look at verse 9, for ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace, again, is written all over this text. Let's, uh, let's begin to break it down a little bit here this morning by looking at the prosperity of Christ. Christ's prosperity. I think this is interesting. Again, looking at verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich. The idea of the fact that he was rich is really speaking of, of uh, Christ who was already in existence. It, it's really dealing with his pre-existence. Uh, he was rich. Hey, Christ did not become God at the incarnation. He already was God. And because he was God, he's co-equal with God. Everything that God owns, Christ owns. Everything that Christ owns, the Holy Spirit owns. There's three persons, one God. They're co-equal. They're, they're co-powerful. They're co-eternal. So what one has, they all have. So, so here is one that has been in existence. He was rich, and yet he's going to become poor. And so we could really look at this text here in the sense of dealing with his eternality. He has always been and forever will be because he is God. He can be nothing less than God. But the text here really, again, dealing with that he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. Really, I want you to understand a little bit about the prosperity. I want you to just kind of focus on what Christ had before he became man, before he was, was uh, placed inside of the womb of Mary. What did Christ have? I want, you to, I want you to just kind of get a picture of the wealth of Christ, the riches of Christ here uh, today, the prosperity of Christ. And I hope and pray that, again, this will be somewhat a blessing to you. I want you to take your uh, Bibles and uh, hold your place here, put a marker in there, do whatever you have to do or something. But go back to the book of Isaiah chapter 6, just to look at one text here. Isaiah chapter 6, uh, we'll get us started here and looking at some of these things and I was blessed as I read and studied and heard some of these things here this past week. I want you to think about this as you're turning in your Bibles, just ex exactly how rich is Christ? You know, I could say uh, uh, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, uh, Bill Gates. They have, they have numbers associated with their wealth, and it's in the billions so you can could, you could measure the wealth of some of these individuals, not by way of their salary. That's a game that they play uh, for tax purposes or whatever. But look at their investments. Look at what they own. Uh, and these are the, some of the wealthiest people in America. 
uh, somebody had said, and I, I heard this, and I don't, don't quote me on the exact numbers. I said, but somebody said, if you took the wealth of those three individuals, put it all together, I forget what it comes out to be, like a trillion dollars or something like that. I mean, the wealth of all of those guys. Uh, I, I was listening to it in the context of the debt that the United States owes. Our debt is somewhere in the area of $26 trillion. And, and even if you took all the wealth of these three individuals, that wouldn't even make a dent on our debt. So it just kind of gives you, again, a perspective on money. But I want to ask you this question. All right, so we understand money because that's the world. We live in a material world. We, we understand that. We understand salaries and expenses and inflation, all kinds of stuff. How rich is Christ? How rich? How rich is he? He is as rich as his father. He is as rich as God is. There was no one ever wealthier than God. Uh, there is no one that owns more than God. Uh, his wealth is immeasurable. I, I want you to think about this. He created all, and it's all for him. Everything that, he, everything that we have and see was created by God. So let's just kind of, again, I always like to... I like, to, I like the rubber to meet the road because that's the way my, my pea brain works here. Uh, think about a, 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 some rancher that has thousands of acres and thousands of, 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 of uh, cattle. And, and you would maybe drive, and in fact, I, I saw this one time. Somebody said uh, there was a property, and I think this is true. I, I, didn't, I didn't fact check. This was in a movie, I hate to tell you. Probably one of those, you know, Hallmark. But I'll tell you what, we're kind of leaving Hallmark. I have to tell you, I have to hear his confession. Hallmark is moving in the wrong direction, folks. I hate to tell you this. There's just some things, and I don't see them all. My wife kind of pops in and out, and she says, oh, turn that one off. It's gone. I mean, there's just things that are happening that are not healthy. It's, it's contrary to the Word of God. And so I don't know what I'm going to do the rest of my life. I'm telling you, pray for me. I, I got some real problems here in this world here. But anyway, I thought I saw in one of these movies where there was somebody, uh, uh, one of these guys was having problems with his life, a young kid and whatever, and was messed up, and he came from a wealthy family, and everything that he had he was spending, and he just wasn't doing right, so somebody, so the rich dad died and left him a will, but he said, in order to get it, you got to go live with your uncle. And this uncle lives on one of these big ranch farms down in Texas somewhere, or whatever it is. And the guy thought, what am I going to do that for? Well, they entered the property, and I think, I, I think I, if I heard it correctly, from the time they entered the property to the time they got to the house, 30-minute drive. I heard that, and I was like, oh, my word, did, did he just a 30-minute drive on his property just to get to that? That's a big ranch. 30 minutes to get to the property, and then, granted, it might not be a great paved road. They're all in their pickup trucks down there in Texas, and some of you guys know a little bit about Texas. I'm going to look at a couple Texans here. Hey, listen, uh, our God owns the th a cattle on a thousand hills. I mean, uh, is there a ranch that's bigger than what God owns? He owns it all, folks. Uh, how, about, how about the wealth? We talked about the Elon Musks and the Jeff Bezos. Hey, listen, the Bible says that the silver and the gold belong to him. It's all his. So if you want to look at material wealth, he owns it. It's his. He created it all. It's all for him. But that's not the wealth we want to talk about here today. We want to talk about the spiritual wealth. We want to just see how wealthy Christ is, because that's what the text is really dealing with here. In Isaiah chapter 6, the passage of Scripture you're open to here, I want you to look at a couple things real quick with me this morning. The Bible says this, in the year that King Uzziah died. Now, you know, every word is given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and every word is there for a reason. And I, I just always like to emphasize that because I read the Bible like you read the Bible. I have devotions like you have devotions, and sometimes you're just reading through things, and you don't always see uh, what God really intended for all this. But God is setting a stage for us here. He's going to tell us here that this is the year that King Uzziah died. Well, who's he? This is the guy that ruled for some 50-plus years. Now, listen. Like him or not, in this case, Uzziah was a good guy, but whether you like the ruler or not, that, a man that rules for that long a period of time offers stability to a country. There's something stable. There's something that, that is reassuring to the residents, the citizens of that land that, hey, listen, okay, I may not like all the decisions, but you know what? This guy's got it under control. You know why? He's got a track record year after year, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. He dies. What does that do to the apple cart? It upsets it for sure. There's a lot of instability. There's like, what's going to happen now? All we've known is King Uzziah. He's been ruling and reigning for a long period of time. Could it possibly be that this is what drove Isaiah to the temple where he catches this incredible vision of God? 
It very well could be. But hey, listen, there's a lesson in and of itself. Hey, we ought to be in the temple praying for God. And the temple could be your closet, your bedroom closet. But you and I need to be praying to God with regard to the land in which we live. We ought to be driven to God, again, out of concern for what's going on in our world. Even in our movie theaters, our Hallmark movies and things of that sort. He goes on and says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I, that's the author of the text, Isaiah, saw also the Lord. I want to tell you something. I never saw this before. You know who the Lord is here? You know the one that's going to be high and lifted up? It's Jesus Christ. Now, listen, I always just thought this was a vision that he had of God, God in general, God the Father. Uh, and, uh, and then I thought, well, maybe it's even, it's all, all three persons of the Godhead because the seraphim are going to be crying out, Holy Father, Holy Son, Holy Holy Spirit. Maybe I thought all three. But you know, I think John the Apostle tells us a little bit more about this text here. He tells us that this is Christ, and, and that's why we're studying it here this morning. We would read this in John chapter 12, verses 37 and following. You needn't turn there. Stay right here in Isaiah. I'm coming back in just a minute. But here's what Isaiah says, or I'm sorry, what John says. But though he had done so many miracles re referencing Christ, yet they, the Jewish people, believed not on him. That the saying of Esaias, which is Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled, which he spake, uh, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord revealed? That's a quote, I believe, out of Isaiah, I think, chapter 53, verse 1. Not this text here. It goes on. Therefore, it goes on and says, uh, they could not believe because that Esaias said again, he's quoting Isaiah, I, so John the Apostle is quoting out of Old Testament, and he's giving us some of these prophecies that Isaiah wrote, recorded for us, and he's referring to them. He goes on and says, He had blinded the mind, the eyes, he had hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and uh, be converted, and I should heal them. So it's an indictment really on the Jewish people that, hey, these things are going to take place somewhere down the road. It was happening even in his time. And then he says this. These things said Esaias when he saw his glory and spake of him. Who's he referring to? He's referring to Christ. Okay, so I just want you to put it into context. The year that Uzziah died, after a 50-year reign, Isaiah, uh, the Bible says, saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. He is in the presence of the Lord. He's in the temple, and he sees this vision. This vision was the Lord sitting on the throne was high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. Okay, so I read this a number of times and I really never paid much attention to the train. Uh, that, that long flowing garment that, that, that comes from royalty. And uh, I learned something that the longer the train, the greater the majesty of the one wearing it. So I thought, ah, is this really true? So... I, I went online and I checked out Kate Middleton when she married Prince William. I think I even watched it that day. I know I am a sucker for all those kind of things there. Uh, I am really pathetic. But, but, but there's something about that couple. I, I really like something about William and Kate. But I looked at her gown. Did you ever, you ever see her wedding gown? Now, I know, listen, this is typical that the bride, the, usually the maid of honor, the matron of honor, whatever, usually goes and she fluffs that all up when they get up on the platform, wherever it is. But there is uh, this matron or maid of honor, I don't know who it was, I didn't study it. Uh, she, I'm not kidding, Kid, Kate's probably from here to that front, front pew, and she's standing back here holding this, this, this long train of the bride. And I thought, whew, that's pretty, that would get weary. And, I mean, I, that's a workout. She probably had to get in shape just to drag that train all the way up that aisle there. But, but the train, again, is symbolic. It's symbolic of, of the majesty, the splendor, the measure of worth and value of the individual wearing it. You know what the Bible says here in Isaiah chapter 6? He, he sees this vision of, of the Lord, and I believe it's Christ. He's high, he's lifted up, and the train, here it is, filled the temple. Filled the temple. Again, I've, I've blown by this numerous times. But I want you to understand, the idea of, 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 uh, of uh, filling the temple here has this idea that, that it is measuring the infinite glory, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, supreme majesty, the unrivaled sovereignty of the one who is wearing this tra train, who is, who is adorned with this long train. 
I mean, it's, it's beyond understanding. So here he is. He sees this vision. The Lord sitting on a throne, high, lifted up, trained is filling the temple. The Bible goes on and says, and above it stood the seraphim. Who are the seraphim? Well, they're the burning ones. These are angels. There's a couple different categories of angels. There's the cherubim, there's the seraphim. The seraphim are the burning ones. The seraphim are often involved in worship. You'll read about the seraphim and the angels, uh, the seraphim angels, often worshiping and praising God. Hey, here they are with their six wings. And you know what they're doing with these wings? It's really interesting. The, the Bible makes it real clear here. With two of their wings, they covered their face. They were probably very aware of the presence of the one in whom they were standing or worshiping. Hey, listen, do you think you and I are going to go up to Jesus someday, put our arm around and say, hey, Jesus, I'll tell you, it's been a long time. I just couldn't. Are you kidding? I mean, the angel, these are holy created beings and they're covering their face in the presence of a holy God. It's an incredible scene. And then it goes on and says with two of these wings, it goes on and says they covered their feet. That would again speak of their unworthiness to be in the presence of God. You know, the Bible will tell us in different passages of Scripture when Moses, you know, saw that burning bush, God instructed, take off your shoes, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. Here these angels are covering their feet, symbolically again, who am I to be in the presence of the one and only God? And it goes on and says, with two, they were able to fly. And, and fly means really, again, in the idea that they were able to do the very beck and will of, of, of the one that was ordering them. Whatever the will of the, the, the one sitting on the throne, do this, do that. That's what angels are. They're ministering spirits. I have a job for you, Gabriel. I want you to go down and visit Mary and tell her that she's going to be with child. I have a job for you, Michael. Uh, go and, 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 and wrestle with this, this, uh, this devil here. This, uh, this, uh, 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 I'm trying to think of some of the other adjectives. But listen, they have jobs to do. And with two of them, they're, they're flying. And, and it's like, it's whatever you say, Master, whatever you say, Lord. This is the one that is sitting on the throne. Don't lose sight of where we're going. This is the one who was rich and gave it all up to come to this earth. Sitting in a place where, again, worshipped and adored. And he said, no, nope, there's mankind down there that is in great need. Though he was rich, yet he became poor. He was going to sacrifice it all for us. I want you to look at a, another text. Uh, it, it's just an incredible picture here. Uh, the highest of highs. Uh, somebody has even likened this an analogy here. If, uh, if, if the Lord Jesus uh, came down to be the emperor of the Roman Empire, uh, that, would, that would be a, a, a lowering of who he is. You say, the Roman Empire, when, this was re uh, when, uh, when Christ came to this earth, was the most prominent power on the face of the earth. I mean, think of the power. And, hey, that would be a step down. But it wouldn't be the step to where Christ went. He went even below that. He went to become a man. He, he was born a babe in a manger in a lowly place. It's an incredible passage of Scripture. The, the Bible makes it very clear in a number of places. Uh, John chapter 17, Jesus is getting ready to offer up himself on that cross. And he cries out to the Father, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self. Here it is, with the glory of which I had with thee before the world was. He understood that glory. He had an opportunity to reveal that glory just for a short, short period of time. Very, very brief moment on this earth, the Mount of Transfiguration. That glory was revealed to the inner circle, the disciples, uh, Peter, James, and John. They got to see a little bit of this, just a sample of it. So I want you to, just, I want you to see the wealth, the spiritual wealth, of the one, again, who's going to give it all up for us. Uh, go over to chapter 9 quickly here, the same book, Isaiah chapter 9. Just look at a text here real fast, Isaiah chapter 9. Here's what the Bible says. Uh, we could look at a number of things here. For unto us a child is born. That really speaks of the humanity of Christ. He came, he was born a child, as all of us were. We were born children. We weren't born adults. He was a child. That speaks again, he became man. And it goes on and says, unto us a son is given. That really, again, defines the deity of Christ. God gave us his son. 
the son is e- e- equal with the father. So, uh, verse 6, for unto us a child is born, unto a son is given. And it says, the government shall be upon his shoulder. Now, now I thought this was kind of interesting. The government being upon his shoulder, it's as if he was wearing this robe around his shoulders. A, a, a robe of, of government, governing the world. Just, just a, a robe around his shoulders. The government is upon his shoulders. He's going to carry the weight of, the, of ruling the world. And by the way, a child, a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And then it goes on, and it, and it tells us a little bit about the, this Christ. Uh, this is, again, interesting. His name shall be called Wonderful. Uh, how would you define wonderful? Real fast, uh, wonderful simply is this. I never like to complicate things again. Uh, wonderful simply means full of wonder. Isn't that profound? But I want you to think about it. He really is full of wonder. He is exceptional. He is distinguishable. Uh, it's, it's a noun. There are a lot of times, a lot of different versions want to combine wonderful with counselor, making it as if it were an adjective describing the counselor, but it is a noun in the original languages, and it again is depicting the very character, the person and work of Christ. He is wonderful. You can put a period after that. He is also a counselor, though, and the idea of being a counselor is he is wise, wise beyond measure. He knows all, sees all. Uh, there, there's nothing that takes God by surprise. He's miles ahead of where you and I are today. He knows what you're going to do the rest of this day, this week, this year. He is wise. He is the counselor. Wisdom just oozes from him. He is the mighty God. The mighty God, that, that really speaks of his power, his omnipotence. Again, I, I believe he was, he was primarily involved in the created world. And listen, he just simply spoke and things happen. Let there be. Boom. There is no talking back to the mighty God. When he speaks, things happen. I think uh, it was Dante and I were talking a couple of weeks ago about, uh, about some of the spoken word of, of Christ. And the one that always comes to my mind is where the, that Christ is asleep on the ship out in the Sea of Galilee and the storm is raging. And the disciples are panicking and like they go and wake him like, don't you fear for your life? You know, and he gets up and simply says something like peace, be still or something like that. Just two or three words. And with those spoken words, the sea calms down. The wind stops blowing. All is at ease. The power of the spoken word of Christ. He is the mighty God. He is the everlasting father. Now, I know this puzzles a lot by way of this title here, but don't get confused by this. Everlasting is describing the Messiah's relationship to time. It really, again, is, uh, uh, and the idea of a father is one that generates or one that, again, begets. He is the one that begets time, as it were, and in particular, eternal life. He is the distributor of eternal life. You want to live forever in heaven? You must know the everlasting father. You must have a relationship with the everlasting father. There's no other way. He's not only the everlasting father, he is the prince of peace. He is the one that brings peace. And I really believe that the ultimate reign of peace will be during the millennium. That's still yet down the road. But here's the deal. You and I don't have to wait for the millennium. If you're right with God, you can have the peace of God in your life. You hopefully have made your peace with God. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 tells us when you get saved, you believe on Christ, you make peace with God. And then as you travel your journey here in this world, hey, listen, we all experience the ups and downs of life. But through it all, God offers his children peace. It's a peace of God that passes all understanding. Somebody can look at your life and say, how can you do that? I don't understand. You're facing this and you're battling that and you got this going on and yet you look like you're, you're, you're comfortable. Hey, listen, it's the peace of God. The Prince of Peace has offered that to believers. The ultimate reign of his, this prince will be, though, the millennium where there will be peace on this earth. So I want to say all this because we're just on point number one. You and I can hardly begin to grasp or imagine the height, the depth, the breadth, or the length of the infinite riches of the glory of God, the Son. Just try to wrap your mind around how wealthy he is. He had it all. He had it all. But the text will go on and tell us here. Look at this text here again. Uh, go back to uh, 2, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 quickly here. 
2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. I want you to look at the poverty of Christ quickly here. I want to remind you of that expression, never has one who was so rich become so poor. No one ever started out so high and became so low. And no one ever divested himself of such wealth and splendor as did the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He chose to become poor. Why did he become poor? Who would do that? Why would he do that? Because he looked at mankind, the prize of his creation. Oh, listen, he spoke things into this world, and things happen, and there's a lot of beauty that surrounds us. But nothing can compare to man, made in the very image and likeness of God. And when he saw the spiritual state of mankind, his heart was grieved. Mankind, again, had walked away from God, walked away from their, their, his creator. Man was, again, doing his own thing. And he looked at the depravity of man and said, something has to be done. Something has to be done. And so he was willing to divest himself of his riches, his wealth, his splendor, and become poor. Man was drowning in sin. Just a couple passages of Scripture to remind you of. Ephesians chapter 2 talks about man being dead in trespasses and sin. We were separated from God because of our sin. It goes on and talks about how we walked according to the course of this world. This is true. This is where we were before Christ. Uh, we, again, were under the subjection to the prince of the power of the air. We were children of disobedience. We were children of wrath. We were, again, fulfilling the desires of our flesh. All of that, chapter 2 of Ephesians, the first three verses. You move to chapter 4 of the same book of Ephesians. It talks about how we walked in the vanity or the emptiness of our mind. Life really just didn't make sense. Uh, life didn't really have meaning and purpose. We're kind of born, we live, we die. Is that all there is to life? No, there's a whole lot more than that. And so man, before salvation, walked in the vanity of their mind. Their understanding was darkened. We were alienated, cut off from the life of God, where there's a blindness of our hearts. We were a past feeling. In other words, we actually became numb to the things of God. Well, I could just take a real quick tangent and just tell you, you know, when I was, when I had religion and I was going to church, and somebody started sharing the gospel with me, and, uh, and I just kind of blew it off. I, I just like, well, that's good for you, but not necessarily for me. I mean, I'm an okay guy. I, I, I go to church. I'm not out running around with my wife. I'm not getting all tanked up in booze and all kinds of stuff. I'm living a decent life here, and, and my heart was hard and calloused. And, and, you know, I'm thankful that that individual just didn't quit. And every time I saw him, he's always handing me another track, always sharing with me. I, I wonder how many times he probably walked away discouraged. Nothing's happening. He's not doing anything. Hey, listen, faith comes by hearing. Some plant, some water. It's God that will give the increase. But I do know this. There was a callousness. There was a hardness to that. It's like, hey, that's for you. I got mine. That's where we were, folks. And this is what God sees from the heavens. He sees man drowning in his own sin. Man without hope. Man without God. Man without peace in this world. Christ saw the spiritual poverty of mankind, and he came to take care of the problem. That's what the incarnation is all about. Why did God become man? Because, because man had a problem. Mark it down, folks. God doesn't have problems. God is, is, is uh, contained within himself. God is at ease with himself. It's man that has the problem, and God again divested himself of all his wealth to become poor for man. Talk about humility. Talk about, again, the, the, the humility of, of, of God who would be willing to do that. And so I want you to understand from the text here, we could see how he became poor. A couple verses. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 and following. Who, being with reference to Christ, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Why? He made himself of no reputation. And the idea of making himself of no reputation as he laid aside the independent exercise of all his attributes. He never lost his deity, folks. He simply veiled his glory. When he came to earth, all people saw was just a babe in a manger. They saw this babe grow up to be a teenage boy. They saw that teenage boy develop into manhood. And all they saw was man. Because, again, the glory and the majesty of the one who was behind all of that was veiled from the eyes of mankind. It goes on and says that he took upon him a form of a servant. That speaks of being a bond slave. He was made in the likeness of men. 
That, that's incredible. That's incredible that he would again take on flesh, that he would again become part of us. He humbled himself, became obedient unto death. We could look at a number of verses that would again talk about some of his humanity, where he was made of a woman, where he was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. Uh, we could talk about his, his humanity in the sense that he hungered and he was tired and he thirsted and he wept and he was tempted in all points. He experienced life like you and I experienced life. And yet with all of that, he never sinned, never sinned. He is still God. He was, again, God through and through. The only person, the only person to be 100% God, 100% man. He never emptied himself of his deity. I have to tell you a funny story, but I really need to move it along here. Um, I remember being in Bible school, and I was so wet behind the ears. I had been a Christian just a number of years, and I wasn't, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't uh, too knowledgeable on a lot of things. Still not in a lot of things. But I was learning, and uh, I struggled with some of this understanding that when God became man, who was running the universe? When God was born of a woman, who was in charge? God. God. It's simply God took on flesh. But God never stopped being God. God forever will be God. When God died on the cross, who was ruling the world? God. The human man of Christ was crucified, was buried, but he rose again. But God was still in charge. God was still ruling. Jesus Christ is God. You cannot kill God. But he experienced life like you and I did. He experienced the human weaknesses, the human limit limitations. And yet here he is, this king, this king of kings and lord of lords. The greatest display of his poverty was not simply just being born of a woman and growing up there in the town of Nazareth. No, the greatest demonstration of his poverty is when he ended up on that cruel cross, when he gave his all. There was nothing more the perfect God-man could give man. He gave us his life. Greater love had no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. What an incredible example of poverty. He, he gave his all as he died on that cruel tree. The depths of his poverty, which he was willing to stoop to, incredible. No one has ever become so spiritually poor as the Lord Jesus Christ. You know why? Because he had it all, and he gave it all up. He had it all, and he gave it all up. And you know why he did that? Look at the text says in 2 Corinthians 8, 9. He was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye, through his poverty, might be rich. I want you to think of the provision of Christ, the provision of Christ. This has nothing to do in the context here uh, of, of Christ providing that, hey, listen, that through Christ's poverty, we would be, has nothing to do with the charismatic name and claim it movement. That adulterates the word of God. Has nothing to do with claiming financial prosperity through the cross of Jesus. It has nothing to do with that. That really, again, is an insult to the gospel of Christ. This is simply, again, saying that Christ became poor so that we could be rich. And we've already spent a lot of time dealing with the wealth of Christ is a spiritual truth that we're trying to communicate. The Bible goes on and tells us in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, that God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherein he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath he quickened us, made us alive together with Christ, and it's by grace that we are saved. He raised us up together, made us to sit together in heavenly places. This is some of the wealth that he's going to bestow on individuals that will humble themselves and recognize, I am a sinner, and there is nothing in me worthy of God. I cry out in faith, asking God to save my soul. And when we do that, we become the recipient of the provisions of God. It's an incredible recipient. Here's a couple things that take place real quick. Some of the spiritual blessings. And I know we just talked about this during Thanksgiving here, but I can't get away from Ephesians 1.13, where God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. All, not some. So what are some of them? Well, hey, listen, I've been given new life. Regeneration is what it is. The Holy Spirit of God came upon me, saved my life, changed me. I have life that will last forever. 
I have the indwelling presence of God in my life. I want you to think how wealthy I am. Hey, listen, apart from salvation, I don't have Christ dwelling in me. I don't have the Holy Spirit. When I got saved, the Spirit of God took up residence within me. I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit. Who am I? I, I I'm, I'm a bankrupt individual crying out to Christ to save me. And God says, hey, listen, I'm going to give you regeneration. I'm going to give you a new life. I'm going to give you the, impres the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to place you into the body of Christ. I am going to seal you to the day of redemption. I'm going to give you a, a new nature. You're going to become a part of the divine nature. You're going to be a new creation in Christ. I'm going to have a new mind, the Bible exhorts us. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. I'm going to have the mind of Christ that's available to me. I'm going to, again, as, as Ezekiel would look to the future and prophesy with regard to the millennial reign, it's going to be a new heart and a new spirit in those that are going to inhabit that, that, that thousand-year reign of Christ. Hey, listen, all of those things are available to the believer today. Here's some of the wealth that God says, I want you to have. I have an inheritance which is incorruptible, undefiled. It fadeth not away. It is reserved for us in heaven. The greatest part of that inheritance is not walking the street of gold or, or gooing over the foundations that are, that are lined with all these precious jewels. The greatest part of our inheritance is the being in the presence of the one who was rich and made himself poor so that we who are poor could be rich for all of eternity with him. It can't get any better than that. That's as good as it gets. What extraordinary riches we have in Christ and set before us for all of eternity. And it will just, I believe, it just gets better. I mean, I already got all that, but I'm beginning to enjoy it and understand it more and bask in it, and I'll have billions and billions of years to bask in the presence of my Savior. How does one receive it? How does one get all of these riches? I mean, once you want those riches, who wouldn't want that? I don't understand. There might be people here. There might be people watching. Who wouldn't want the wealth of eternity and all that God has to offer us? Here's what we do. Cry out. Lord, I'm bankrupt. There's nothing in me worthy of that. I've come to the end of myself. I've tried to do it my way. And as I read and understand the word of God, my way is just insufficient. And I can try as I may, and if I had a thousand lifetimes to try, I will fail miserably. I will never get to heaven on the coattails of my good works, my church attendance, the prayers I offered up, the generosity of my heart. None of that will get me to heaven. Zero. I am bankrupt. Zero. I have nothing to offer you, God. I am a sinner, a wretched sinner in need of a Savior. I come before the Lord and I cry out, Lord, unclean, unclean, not worthy. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Be merciful to me. I have no capital to buy my way into heaven. My sin debt is just too great. But thank you, Lord, that though you were rich, you became poor. And that through your poverty, I could be made rich. This vast kingdom awaits those who trust in Christ for salvation. You have an inheritance that money cannot buy and death cannot take away. You realize the assets that have been transferred to your account? Incredible. Off the charts. You can't put a measuring tape around it. You can't put a scale that's big enough to hold it. You can't look at a bank account. It, it's just an incredible assets that have been applied to our account. No matter how great our sin, his riches are far greater. And he gave all that up. He divested himself of his wealth for us. What a provision. What a provision. Jesus Christ is truly the greatest, bar none, not even close, the greatest giver of all time. Mark it down. It is truth. And he did it for you and for me. Let's pray. 
Father, thank you for this truth that is nestled here in a passage of Scripture that teaches us as believers about grace giving. And Lord, I'm so thankful that you included a passage of Scripture that elevates the ultimate giver of all time. We thank you for your love that gave us your son. And we're thankful for his love that gave us his life. Thankful for the Holy Spirit. We would be remiss to not mention the Spirit of God and the work that he continues to do in the lives of mankind. I'm so thankful that he has come to convict and challenge and change individuals. He's there to certainly let us know that we are sinners in need of righteousness. And yea, there's a judgment to follow. And I pray, Father, that we have heard from the Holy Spirit even here today. And Lord, if there be unsaved that are in our midst or again watching at home on live stream, I pray today would be the day of salvation. Save souls, Lord. Oh, I pray that some would become uh, partakers of the wealth of Christ. He gave it up for us. And I pray, Father, that there be some that would, would want to receive that and bask in it and enjoy it for all of eternity. Save souls would be our plea. And Lord, for the believer, I pray that we'll leave rejoicing. Uh, I pray that this Christmas season we'll just continue to reflect on the incredible God that we have the privilege of worshiping, ascribing worth to. We are a blessed people. And I'm thankful, Lord, that uh, this has all been made known to us by way of your word by way of the season that is upon us. And Lord, for that we give you thanks. Lord, if there's unsaved, I pray that today would be the day. Save souls. And Lord, for that we'll thank you. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I don't often do this, but let me just ask you this before we dismiss you and by way of another song, let me just ask you to reflect on some of the things you've heard here today. If you're a believer here today, I, I, I know that you probably know most of what we just talked about here today, but it's always good to review it and just remind ourselves of the greatness of our God and all that he had, and all that he was willing to give up for us. And so I pray that in the the quietness of your heart, you're saying, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you love me that much. We we can hardly begin to understand it, because we're of limited ability, our finite minds. We serve an infinite God. And I dare say just a few minutes in glory, you will recognize how good God has been to us. So in the quietness of your heart as a believer in Christ, thank him for what he's done for you. But it's very possible that there are some here today or even some watching at home that know not Christ, never have become the recipient of this wealth, this spiritual wealth he offers you. And I'm wondering if there are some that would simply here in our assembly, raise a hand, say, Pastor, please pray for me. I'm not so sure I am saved. I'm not so sure I have Christ. Maybe I have religion. Maybe I have some knowledge, but I I never remember asking Christ to be my savior. I, I never emptied myself of self. Today, I'd like to do something about it. I'd like this Christmas to be a different Christmas. I'd like to get saved. I'd like to to know this Christ. And if that's you, would you simply raise your hand? Raising your hand will not save you, but it will recognize. You'll recognize it. I'll recognize it. I'll pray for you. And I'll be glad to help you afterwards in any which way I can. So I'm wondering if there are some here today. Pastor, please pray for me. Maybe some of you have been coming to church here for a long while. Coming to church will not get you to heaven. Jesus Christ is the only way. Do you know him? If you don't, here's an opportunity for you to get right with God through faith in Christ and him alone. So simply raise a hand and I'll pray for you and I'll try to help you in any way I can. I don't see hands raised here in the auditorium. Maybe there are some at home that are watching and I pray that again God will speak to your heart just the same. And I pray that if there's a need that you have, especially with regard to salvation, that you'll write us or call us. We'd be glad to help you in any way we can. Father, you have blessed us, and we give you praise for what you've done, for what you're going to do. Bless the remainder of the day, we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Folks, we're going to take our hymn books, and we're going to...